Year of the Big Thaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Weeks. Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Mr. Emmett did his duty by the visitor from another world, never doubting the right of it. In this warm and fanciful story of a Connecticut farmer, Marion Zimmer Bradley has caught some of the glory that is man's love for man, no matter who he is, nor whence he's from. By heck, you'll like little Matt. You say that Matthew is your own son, Mr. Emmett? Yes, Reverend Doan, and a better boy never stepped, if I do say as shouldn't. I've trusted him to drive team for me since he was eleven, and you can't say more than that for a farm boy. Way back when he was a little shaver so high, when the war came on, he was bounden he was going to sail with this Admiral Farragut. You know boys that age, like runaway colts. I couldn't see no good in his being cabin boy on some tarnation navy ship, and I told him so. If he'd wanted to sail out on a whaling ship, I low I'd have let him go. But Marthy, that's the boy's ma, took on so that Matt stayed home. Yes, he's a good boy and a good son. We'll miss him a powerful lot if he gets this scholarship thing, but I low it'll be good for the boy to get some learning besides what he gets in the school here. It's right kind of you, Reverend, to look over this application thing for me. Well, if he is your own son, Mr. Emmett, why did you write birthplace unknown on the line here? Reverend Doan, I'm glad you asked me that question. I've been turning it over in my mind and I've just about come to the conclusion it wouldn't be no-how fair to hold it back. I didn't lie when I said Matt was my son, because he's been a good son to me and Marthy, but I'm not his pa and Marthy ain't his ma, so could be I stretched the truth just a mite. Reverend Doan, it's a tarnal funny yarn, but I'll walk into the meetin' house and swear to it on a stack of Bibles as thick as a cord of wood. You know I've been farming the old corning place these past seven year. It's good flat Connecticut bottom land, but it isn't like our land up in Hampshire where I was born and raised. My pa called it the Hampshire Grants, and all that was King's land when his pa came in there and started farming at the foot of the Scuttock Mountain. That's engine for fires, folks say, because the engines used to build fires up there in the spring for some of their heath and doodads. Anyhow, up there in the mountains we see eternal power of queer things. You call to mind the year we had the big thaw about twelve years before the war? You mind the blizzard that year? I heard tell it spread down most to York, and at Fort Orange, the place they call Albany now, the Hudson froze right over, so they say. But those York folks do a sight of exaggerating, I'm told. Anyhow, when the ice went out, there was an almighty good thaw all over, and when the snow run off Scuttock Mountain, there was a good-sized hunk of farmland in our valley went under water. The crick on my farm flowed over the bank, and there was a foot of water in the cow shed, and down in the swimming hole in the back pasture wasn't nothing but a big gully, fifty foot and more across, rushing through the pasture, deep as a lake, and brown as the old cow. You know fresh at floods? full up with sticks and stones and old dead trees and somebody's old shed floating down the middle. And I swear to goodness, Parson, that stream was running along so fast I saw four-inch cobblestones floating and bumping along. I tied the cow and the calf and Kate. She was our white mare. You mind she went lame last year and I had to shoot her, but she was just a young mare then and skittish as all get out, but she was a good little mare. Anyhow, I tied the whole kit and caboodle of them in the woodshed up behind the house, where they'd be dry. Then I started to get the milk pail. Right then I heard the gosh awfulish screech I ever heard in my life. It sounded like thunder and a freshet and a forest fire all at once. I dropped the milk pail as I heard Marthy scream inside the house, and I run outside. Marthy was already there in the yard, and she points up in the sky and yelled, Look up yander! We stood looking up at the sky over Shattuck Mountain, where there was a great big chute now, I don't know as I can call its name, but
but it was like a trail of fire in the sky, and it was making the dangdest racket you ever heard, Reverend. Looked kind of like one of them Fourth of July sky rockets, but it was big as a house. Marthy was screaming, and she grabbed me and hollered, Hez, Hez, what in Tunket is it? And when Marthy cusses like that, Reverend, she don't know what she's saying, she's so scared. I was plumb scared myself. I heard Lisa, that's our young un, Lisa Grace, that got married to the tailor boy. I heard her crying on the stoop, and she came flying out with her penny all black and hollering to Marthy that the pea soup was burning. Marthy let out another screech and ran for the house. That's a woman for you. So I quieted Lisa down some, and I went in and told Marthy it weren't no more than one of them shooting stars. Then I went and did the milking. But you know, while we were sitting down to supper, there came the most awful grinding, screeching, pounding crash I ever heard. Sounded if it were in the back pasture, but the house shook as if something had hit it. Marthy jumped a mile, and I never saw such a look on her face. Hez, what was that? she asked. Shoot now, nothing but the freshet, I told her. But she kept on about it. You reckon that shooting star fell in our back pasture, Hez? Well now, I don't low it did, nothing like that, I told her. But she was jittery as an old hen, and it weren't like her know-how. She said it sounded like trouble, and I finally quieted her down by saying I'd saddle Kate up and go have a look. I kind of thought, though, I didn't tell Marthy that somebody's house had floated away in the freshet and run aground in our back pasture. So I saddled up Kate and told Marthy to get some hot rum ready in case there was some poor soul run aground back there, and I rode Kate back to the back pasture. It was mostly uphill because the top of the pasture is on high ground, and it sloped down to the crick on the other side of the rise. Well, I reached the top of the hill and looked down. The crick were a regular river now, rushing along like Niagara. On the other side of it was a stand of timber, then the slope of Shattuck Mountain, and I saw right away the long streak where all the timber had been cut out in a big scoop, with roots standing up in the air, and a big slide of rocks down to the water. It was still raining a mite, and the ground was sloshy and squanchy underfoot. Kate scrunched her hooves and got real balky, not liking it a bit. When we got to the top of the pasture, she started to whine and wicker and stamp, and no matter how loud I woed, she kept on a stampin', and I was plumb scared she'd pitch me off in the mud. Then I started to smell a funny smell, like something burning. Now don't ask me how anything could burn in all that water, because I don't know. When we came up on the rise, I saw the contraption. Reverend, it was the most tarnal crazy contraption I ever saw in my life. It was bigger nor my cowshed, and it was long and thin and shiny as Marthy's old pewter pitcher her ma brought from England. It had a pair of red rods sticking out behind, and a crazy globe fitted up where the top ought to be. It was stuck in the mud, turned halfway over on the little slide of roots and rocks, and I could see what had happened all right. The thing must have been, now, Reverend, you can say what you like, but that thing must have flew across Shattuck and landed on the slope in the trees, then turned over and slid down the hill. That must have been the crash we heard. The rods weren't just red, they were red hot. I could hear them sizzle as the rain hit them. In the middle of the infernal contraption there was a door, and it hung all to other as if every hinge on it had been wrenched halfway off. As I pushed old Kate alongside it, I heard somebody hollering alongside the contraption. I didn't know how get the words, but it must have been for help, because I looked down and there was a man flopping along in the water. He was a big fellow, and he wasn't swimming, just thrashing and hollering. So I pulled off my coat and boots and hove in after him. The stream was running fast, but he was near the edge, and I managed to catch on to an old tree root and hang on, keeping his head out of the water till I got my feet aground. Then I hauled him onto the bank. Up above me, Kate was still whinnying and raising Ned, and I shouted at her as I bent over the man. Well, Reverend, he sure did give me a surprise. Weren't no proper man I'd ever seed before. 
He was wearing some kind of red clothes, real shiny and sort of stretchy, and not wet from the water like you'd expect, but dry, and it felt like that silk and India rubber stuff mixed together. And it was such a bright red that at first I didn't see the blood on it. When I did, I knew he wa were a goner. His chest were all stove in, smashed to pieces. One of the old tree roots must have jabbed him as the current flung him down. I thought he were dead already, but then he opened up his eyes. A funny color they were, greeny yellow, and I swear, Reverend, when he opened them eyes, I felt he was reading my mind. I thought maybe he might be one of them circus fellers in their flying contraptions that hung on at the bottom of a balloon. He spoke to me in English, kind of choky and stiff, not like Joe the Portagey sailor, or like those tarnal dumb Frenchies up Canady way, but, well, funny. He said, My baby, in ship, get baby. He tried to say more, but his eyes went shut and he moaned hard. I yelped, God Almighty! Excuse me, Reverend, but I was so blame upset that's just what I did say. God Almighty, man! You mean there's a baby in that there dingful contraption? He just moaned, so after spreading my coat around the man a little bit, I just plunged in that there river again. Reverend, I heard tell once about some tomful idiot going over Niagara in a barrel, and I tell you it was like that when I tried crossing that freshet to reach that contraption. I went under and down and was whacked by floating sticks and whirled around in the freshet. But somehow, I don't know, how, except by the pure grace of God, I got across that raging torrent and clumb up to where the crazy dingful machine was sitting. Ship, he'd called it, but that were no ship, reverend. It was some flying dragon kind of thing. It was a real scary looking thing, but I clumb up to the little door and hauled myself in, and sure enough, there was other people in the cabin, only they was all dead. There was a lady and a man and some kind of an animal looked like a bobcat only smaller with a funny shaped rooster comb along its head they all even the cat thing was wearing those shiny stretchy clothes and they was all so battered and smashed i didn't even bother to hunt for their heartbeats i could see by a look that they was dead as a doornail then i heard a funny little whimpering like a kitten and in a funny rubber cushioned thing there's a little boy baby looked about six months old he was howling lusty enough, and when I lifted him out of the cradle kind of thing, I saw why. That boy baby, he was wet, and his little arm was twisted under him. That there flying contraption must have smashed down awful hard, but that rubber hammock was so soft and cushiony all it did to him was jolt him good. I looked around, but I couldn't find anything to wrap him in, and the baby didn't have a stitch on him except a sort of a spongy paper diaper wet as sin. So I finally lifted up the lady, who had a long cape thing around her, and took the cape off her real gentle. I knew she was dead, and she wouldn't be needing it, and that baby boy would catch his death if I took him out bare naked like that. She was probably the baby's ma. A right pretty woman she was, but smashed up something shameful. So anyhow, to make a long story short, I got that baby boy back across that Niagara Falls somehow, and laid him down by his pa. The man opened his eyes, kind, and said in a choky voice, Take care, baby. I told him I would, and said I'd try to get him up to the house where Marthy could doctor him. The man told me not to bother. I dying, he says. We come from planet, star up there, crash here. His voice trailed off into a language I couldn't understand, and he looked like he was praying. I bent over him and held his head on my knees real easy, and I said, Don't worry, mister, I'll take care of your little fellow until your folks come after him. Before God I will. So the man closed his eyes, and I said, Our Father, which art in heaven, and when I got through he was dead. I got him up on Kate, but he was cruel heavy for all he was such a tall skinny fellow. Then I wrapped that there baby up in the cape thing, and took him home and give him to Marthy. And the next day I buried the fellow in the South Meadow, and next meeting day we had the baby baptized Matthew Daniel Emmett and brung him up just like our own kids. That's all. All, Mr. Emmett, didn't you ever find out where that ship really came from? 
Why, Reverend, he said it came from a star. Dying men don't lie, you know that. I asked the teacher about them planets he mentioned, and she says that on one of the planets, can't rightly remember the name, March or Mark or something like that, she says some big scientist feller with a telescope saw canals on that planet, and they'd have to be pretty near as big as this here Erie Canal to see them so far off. And if they could build canals on that planet, I don't know why they couldn't build a flying machine. I went back the next day when the water was down a little to see if I couldn't get the rest of them folks and bury them, but the flying machine had broke up and washed down the creek. Marthy's still got the cape thing. She's a powerful saving woman. We never did tell Matt, though. Might make him feel funny to think he didn't really belong to us. But, but, Mr. Emmett, didn't anybody ask questions about the baby, where you got it? Well, now... Although they was curious because Marthy hadn't been in the family way and they knew it, but up here folks minds their own business pretty well, and I just let them wonder. I told Lisa Grace I'd found her new little brother in the back pasture, and of course it was the truth. When Lisa Grace growed up, she thought it was just one of those yarns old folks tell the little shavers. And has Matthew ever shown any differences from the other children that you could see? Well, Reverend, not so's you could notice it. He's powerful smart, but his real pa and ma must have been right smart too to build a flying contraption that could come so far. Of course, when he was about twelve years old, he started reading folks' minds, which didn't seem exactly right. He'd tell Marthy what I was thinking and things like that. He was just at the pesky age. Lisa Grace and Minnie were both a courtin' then, and he'd drive their boyfriends crazy telling them what Lisa Grace and Minnie were a-thinking, and tease the gals by telling them what the boys were thinking about. There weren't no harm in the boy, though. It was just all teasing, but it just weren't decent somehow, so I took him out behind the woodshed and give his britches a good dusting just to remind him that that kind of thing weren't polite nohow. And Reverend Doan, he ain't never done it since. End of Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley Recording by Greg Weeks